He's been working on and off the air for, in radio for more than five decades. He's a community activist, a strong supporter of local community organizations, including the Canadian Red Cross, which, yay, we're always happy for. But right now, he's most excited and passionate about working on his master's at SFU. I'd like everyone to welcome Don Schaefer. It's a uh, real pleasure to be here. I was uh, speaking with Joanne and Christine uh, yesterday. Yeah, yesterday. Uh, no, the day before on the air. And uh, so I've asked all my questions. So I'm really going to have to rely on you. Uh, we have a wonderful panel today. Uh, we have Don Wright, Renee Black, and Mariko Miller. And uh, just to do a, a quick introduction, and then we'll start off. Don Wright is the acting manager of activism for Amnesty International. Renee Black is the executive director of Peace Geeks. And Mariko Miller is a nurse of medicine sans frontiers, or doctors without borders. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we're going to start with uh, Don. Uh, Don Wright is the acting manager of the activism team for Amnesty International Canada. He manages staff and volunteers across the country and is based at the Vancouver office. He works to promote public engagement with human rights, issues rooted in Canada and around the world. Don has a master's in adult education from St. Xavier University and a BA in adult education from the University of the Fraser Valley. Don? Thanks, Don. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. And how's my mic doing? Is it okay? Good. Okay, great. Uh, so I'm with Amnesty International, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with some aspects of Amnesty International. Uh, the fact that we're pretty uh, dedicated to the promotion and protecting, protection of human rights around the world. And we do this by carefully researching and documenting human rights violations, uh, looking for cases where governments who either don't have the right legislation or have the right laws but aren't enforcing them in ways that uh, allow for impunity for perpetrators of human rights violations to, to get away with that. So, and the big piece for Amnesty, of course, is not just that we research and document these situations, but that we give people opportunities to take action. And that's something that we're unique in the world around human rights activism in terms of you know, large organizations. We're, we are the largest. Uh, we have something like 8 million members around the world in 150 countries. So we've got quite a reach. And at the same time, we've got a lot of our staff in various parts of the world who are on the ground uh, for all kinds of situations when there's, when there's civil unrest, uh, when there are disasters of all kinds, um, and of course when there's conflict or, or conflict is starting to develop in areas, uh, we get as close as we can to what's happening so that we're able to uh, talk to people directly who are experiencing those violations. We get to talk to people that are fleeing across borders. Uh, we talk to officials, we talk to family members, uh, you know, uh, authorities, uh, getting a complete story or picture of what's happening. And often that results in uh, you know, reports uh, that detail, you know, lots of detail, lots of eyewitness accounts of what's happening in a particular place or time. Um, sometimes it requires us to issue urgent actions, which is around, uh, we, there's things happening right now on the ground and people need to pay attention to this, and we need our, our members around the world to take action and push governments to take the right action as well. And so we've got into a, a world of real-time uh, reporting on human rights violations. Um, in the old days, you used to have to wait weeks or months before you get an amnesty report. Now you're likely to get it tweeted to you, or we've got an app you can, you can uh, download, SOS Amnesty, uh, where if it's happening somewhere in the world, you can respond right now uh, to what's happening. Uh, and it's all about using public pressure to push governments to, the, to do the right thing, uh, and whether that's offering protection to, uh, in the case of this, this conference, uh, of course, offering protection to aid workers, humanitarian officials, uh, United Nations officials, uh, so they can get in with the aid that's, that's uh, so, so definitely, definitely required. Uh, and I've just got three examples I want to give you of, of what that work actually looks like uh, for us and, and why it's important, uh, why we're kind of part of this panel around uh, humanitarian work in, in conflict. Um, so one example I have is in, from September, uh, the Syrian government uh, attacked on a UN uh, Syrian Arab Red Crescent aid convoy that was on its way to um, people trapped in Aleppo. So it was stopped at a warehouse, they were loading volunteers and civilians were loading these trucks with, with all kinds of medical supplies and, and aid of various kinds. And uh, that night there was two hours of intense bombing 
uh, that completely destroyed 21 out of the 31 trucks, killed 20 uh, aid workers and civilian volunteers. Um, and uh, our, our position on that is if that was a deliberate attack on that facility, uh, that would constitute a war crime crime against humanity. So we're pretty clear in what we, what we call these, these, these kinds of uh, terrible actions. Um, another example, uh, more recently in February, and some of you may, may be more familiar with the story than I am, uh, six employees of the International Committee of the Red Cross were killed uh, in northern Afghanistan. Uh, and our South Asia director said that by targeting the ICRC, who devote their lives to helping people in desperate need, the perpetrators have demonstrated a horrific contempt for human life. He also called on the Afghan authorities to immediately investigate these civilian deaths and bring the perpetrators to justice. So that's a key piece for a lot of our actions. It's not just that, that, uh, 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 that we call attention to an issue or, or things that are, are crimes against humanity. Uh, we call on governments to actually investigate and, and bring the perpetrators to justice uh, as a signal to others that this is not acceptable uh, uh, behavior or activity. Um, the final example, a little bit different, and this is a case where a government prevented aid from getting into an area of the country. In this case, um, it was uh, the, uh, the North uh, Rakhine state of uh, Myanmar, uh, where as a result of, a, of an attack on a, on a police station, uh, the government uh, brought in a security response that basically cut off 150,000 people from the aid that they depended upon uh, because they were already targeted and already stuck in this area of, of Myanmar um, without any resources, without the ability to move around, to work, and, and, and so on. And now their aid was being completely cut off by the government. So in mid-November, we issued an urgent action. Uh, and this happens, it goes out by email, it goes out by, by SMS, it goes out by, by faxes and mail, get our members around the world to, to respond and call on the government of Myanmar to, to allow the aid into that part of the country. Um, we renewed that call in mid-December because nothing was happening. The government of Myanmar wasn't responding. But I'm happy to report by mid-January, they had started to allow the aid into that area. Uh, so tens of thousands of those, 130,000, were, were already getting aid at the time we, we issued that final update uh, to say that that had achieved a certain amount of success uh, in terms of, of aid finally getting in. And we've seen over the years lots of cases where governments have used aid, food aid, other kinds of aid as a political weapon, where they, we only allow it into the areas that are, that are favorable or that are under their control, um, any area that's maybe controlled by other militias or rebel groups, uh, the aid is blocked from getting into there. We've seen those cases like that, both in terms of conflict and in terms of a response to natural disasters. So uh, the use of food and aid as, as a weapon uh, is something that, of course, is against international law and another area that we really point out quite, quite, uh, quite regularly. Um, I didn't find any statistics in our, in our own reports. We didn't track it quite that way, but I did find a really interesting website called aidworkerssecurity.org and it maps how many, what happens to humanitarian aid workers around the world uh, year by year. And in, in 2015, they recorded 120 aid workers killed, I mean the line of duty, uh, 88 wounded, and 121 kidnapped, which is actually the more popular way of attacking aid workers, is to, is to kidnap them. Uh, in 2016, very similar numbers, 109 killed, 110 wounded, wounded and 68 kidnapped. Uh, in, in, the line of, in the line of duty of, of, of you know, working in, on convoys or, or on uh, refugee camps and so on. I think that's probably where I'll end it. That's a lot. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a lot having, uh, having subscribed uh, uh, to those tweets, and I see that the tweets are increasing, not decreasing. So <coughs> uh, we're, we're glad you're there. It's unfortunate, but we're glad you joined. Renee Black is next. Renee is the founder and executive director of Peace Geeks, a Canadian not-for-profit organization that focuses on leveraging technology to strengthen peace building, human rights, and humanitarian response. Founded in 2011, Peace Geeks has worked in more than 18 countries in the global south to explore how technology and innovation can strengthen the impact of both small community-based NGOs and international institutions alike. Uh, I have actually okay. there, but I just didn't know the easier for me to see myself. Okay.
Renee's experience includes over eight years of business as a, eight years as a business analyst and technology project manager in the private sector, along with two years as an expert on the Women, Peace, and Security Framework, including with the United Nations and the Global Network of Women's Peace Builders. Renee holds a Bachelor of Commerce from Dalhousie and a Master's of International Affairs from the University of Ottawa. She is a fellow of the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations. <laughs> Uh, and thanks for having me here today. Um, it's quite an honor to be here with all these organizations. I was looking at the back of the, the, the brochure here, and Peace Geeks is on there with all these international organizations. And uh, we're, we have three full-time team members, so to be alongside <laughs> you is really quite uh, quite remarkable for me for us. So <clears throat> thank you for inviting us here today. Um, uh, Peace Geeks has been around for about five and a half years. We're based here in Vancouver, in Gas Town. Um, and what we, we, we started out really as trying to uh, look at how technology could get, uh, could support different groups in terms of trying to amplify local voices and strengthen local resilience. Um, and I, I personally sort of got passionate about this area because of my work in the women peace building space. Um, looking specifically at the uh, critical roles of women um, <coughs> in, uh, in peace building and conflicts so over the world. Um, but uh, but we've, we've gotten into a number of different spaces over the course of the last couple of years, and specifically the, into the humanitarian space a bit more recently. <clears throat> and actually, I have a question from the, to the last pan couple of panels that I'm going to bring up a little bit later on. Um, but um, uh, anyway, what I want to talk about, just give you a bit of an overview. Actually, first of all, how many of you have heard of Peace Geeks before, just for my reference? Okay, great, thanks. Um, all right, so we, we, we've been around, like I say, for about five and a half years. We have two major programs. We work on building te uh, technology capacity for uh, capacities for small organizations, but also in some cases, larger institutions. Uh, and we also try to look at how we can engage uh, global citizens, and that includes the corporate sector in terms of strengthening response on certain areas. Um, and so we are not strictly a humanitarian organization. Um, so um, one, of our, 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 one of our core programs is on uh, looking at how do we strengthen the access to information for on humanitarian services available to those affected by conflict. And I'll be getting to that in a bit more detail. But we actually also have a program that's looking at how, um, how online spaces are used to spread violence um, and hate and what kind of uh, uh, what can be done to try to um, challenge some of those uh, issues. Uh, likewise, we also have another program that's focused on digital security and how do we strengthen the capacity of those working uh, on sensitive issues, including human rights defense, but also very much humanitarian work in terms of trying to make sure that your, uh, the data that is being sh uh, shared and transferred is being done in a way that's responsible and not putting people um, at further risk. Um, we also locally have um, quite a bit of work on trying to engage locals on, in, on these conversations. Um, so we have a global citizens program looking at how do we get uh, skilled professionals um, involved in volunteer work with, uh, in this space. Uh, we also have uh, private companies donating some of their, their, their time to, to this work. Um, and then we also have a disaster response program, uh, which I'll go into a bit more. Uh, so we've worked in about 24 countries around the world, but we have two uh, general focus areas right now. We're, we're largely focused on the Middle East and East Africa. Uh, Great Lakes region, um, and I'll tell you a bit more about a couple of these. So, um, one, one of the pro I'm not going to go too much into this, but we have a program that's about to kick off that's looking at how social media and online spaces are being used, um, and how not only how our, our, our recruitment techniques being used to recruit young people into uh, violent extremist groups, but also how um, local communities are using those same tools to try to respond and try to put out different positive alternative narratives to those. Um, likewise, uh, this is a uh, fellow named uh, Richard Nasimbo who works in um, uh, S LGBTQ rights in Uganda. Um, he's focused on, uh, I, his work was, um, he was working on um, uh, collecting data on uh, people affected, uh, or uh, people in his community and their, uh, their office was broken into, the, uh, their computer stolen, um, and a year later when uh, the government of Uganda to pass a law on, 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 on uh, making it illegal to have any uh, uh, 
a homosexual act, and they published name and photos of everybody that had contained that database. So this just gives you some sense for how um, much at risk some some people end up being put at, and there's a lot of good people out there doing great work and not, often not having um, awareness around what kind of risks they're taking. So anyway, that's, that's a bit more uh, context for um, the kinds of work that um, is happening. Locally, we've had about 1,300 people sign up to volunteer with us, and that ranges from everything from accountants to finance people, to developers, and social media folks. Uh, so it's quite a big range, and it's, we've, we've been really excited about the, the interest locally. Um, and this, this particular photo is from a hackathon that we held in November that was on hacking resettlement. And so basically we were looking at, um, you know, we're in a context right now where, um, where uh, there's a lot of anti-immigrant rhetoric. Uh, how do we bring together tech professionals, uh, resettlement organizations, immigrants, re refugees, uh, to try to explore how we can do better um, at bringing people to Canada and making sure that they can integrate into communities. Um, and we're going to be having a follow-on event to that in uh, probably May or June this year. Um, we also will host a speaker series, which we are very pleased to co-host with Amnesty International. Um, and so we've done 37 talks so far. Those take place at the Hive, um, just a couple blocks from here. Um, and we, we, we cover a lot, a big uh, range of activities, including many topics so, on humanitarian. Our next one's coming up, uh, looking at uh, defending land rights, uh, including uh, how technology plays a role. But anyway, um, I, what I actually wanted to talk to you about today was about um, how the digital humanitarian space. Um, how many of you know about the digital humanitarian space? Okay, all right, great. So this is a fairly new topic. Um, so how, how this um, space came into being um, is, uh, is something, is, uh, it was about 2008 during the, during the Haiti crisis. Um, there's, a, there's a tool called Lucha Haiti that had been used to document um, incidents of violence in Kenya um, after the political elections in 2008. And um, in this particular case, we were um, the, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the people who had been involved in that initiative wanted to reach out and get uh, volunteers and students to help out to map out um, incidents related to uh, or uh, issues around the Haiti earthquake. So that was people who were trapped under rubble, um, people, um, buildings that were collapsed, and tried to better understand what was happening and try to provide some response. And there, there was many good things that came out of that, and there were also some um, bad things that came out of that. Um, in particular, there was one incident where um, a, a group of bandits had basically put a whole bunch of dots on a map to divert authorities to one area and then went and robbed the facility. So, um, and this was one of the very early interventions. So there is a, there is a, you know, there's just a bit of gaming of this, and there's, you know, these are some of the risks that come with technology. Um, but that that um, that pilot essentially led to what's called the Digital Humanitarians Network. Um, and the Digital Humanitarians Network is a group of organizations that basically try to provide support in terms of different types of disaster response during emergencies. And so we, we provide certain types of response in terms of um, mapping of incidents and um, social media analysis and, and, and so on. Um, but there's also groups like Translators Without Borders that can help to do uh, translation um, for the local languages and they have a, a network of professional translators um, there's also statistics without borders, uh, humanitarian open street maps, and so on. So there's a really great uh, array of organizations that are out there. And um, the way that it works is when a disaster strikes, um, organizations that are offering response, including OCHA, will basically make a request to the network um, to, to deploy in support of an operation. Um, so there's been a few, oh, oops, I have the wrong title on there. But anyway, this is actually um, one of the initiatives that was done uh, to try to map the healthcare facilities during the Ebola crisis. Um, and part of the, the, the function here is to try to make sure that there was an understanding of which, which were the clinics that were taking Ebola um, patients and which were the ones that were not, so that there was a reduction of um, uh, people um, getting infected by going to the wrong clinics. Um, and there were some problems with how well that worked, but it was, it, it, the idea was interesting. And it, 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 I think that there will be there was a lot of lessons that were learned from this on how to improve it in the future. Um, one of the major projects that we have been involved with as Peace Geeks, um, as we, and also through the Digital Humanitarians Network, uh, we received a request from the UN High Commissioner for Refugees about three years ago to work on a project to map all the service providers and activities that are taking place in Jordan. Um, so Jordan, uh, as many of you heard from our uh, former colleagues, um, 
supports about 655,000 people. Um, and so what we were trying to do is uh, build an app that basically has uh, the most up-to-date information on all the services that are available. Um, so we have uh, since then actually um, been received requests from Turkey, uh, Munich there in Turkey, as well as in Somalia, to deploy the same app there. And we're also about to start um, uh, working with southern Syria on deploying their um, the cross-border in Jordan. Um, and it helps in, in a couple of different ways. And the it, refugees right now don't have access to this information directly. Um, it's very difficult to keep this information up to date. Um, and so, um, so, so they don't have that. And to the extent that this information is available, it's to the service providers. Um, and even they often don't have the most up to date information. Um, because it, and it's, the information changes quickly because of donor priorities, because of staff turnover, um, because of organizations' um, pri priorities, and so on. Um, and so, actually, just one quick pitch that I'm going to make for us is that uh, Peace Geeks has been, um, has been chosen as a finalist, at, along with the Red Cross, actually, in the Google Impact Challenge. Um, and we are basically looking at trying to bring Services Advisor to Canada um, in order to help strengthen the integration of immigrants into Canadian communities through this idea called uh, Services Advisor Pathways. Um, so I'm happy to talk about that with anybody who wants to, but I think I'm going a bit over my time. Um, there's also an, initi an initiative called TechFugees, which was a series of hackathons that was focused on um, trying to bring um, uh, uh, is to strengthen the use of technology and applications in order to support uh, refugees. As this is particularly during the migrant crisis. Um, and I just want one comment on this is that I think that there is, and I think a broader comment that I'm interested is in is there's a huge amount of interest, and there was a huge amount of interest, of interest during the, this crisis. Um, and um, a lot of that interest ended up uh, not, in, in many cases, not turning into um, a lot of very useful um, applications and tools. And there's a, and I think it was partly because there was a mismatch between the need and the supply, um, but also not necessarily a lot of uh, conversations. So I think that there's an incredibly important role and opportunity to, to play in terms of trying to harness what that interest is out there, but there aren't right now the right mechanisms to try to bring those two together. Um, and so I think that that's an area that I think we can contribute. And I, I'm not going to, there's, a, I can also talk about drones, but I think, I think I've gone a little bit over my time, so I'm going to pause and stop. So thank you. I'm out of breath. Sorry. Uh, are you out of breath? <laughs> That was uh, really amazing, thank you. Uh, and lots of questions, so so get ready. Uh, Mariko Miller is next. Mariko is a graduate of, UB, of the UBC School of Nursing. She went on to complete her master's in public health in developing countries through the London School of Hygiene and Tropical, Tropical Medicine. She is currently working in Vancouver as a sexual assault examiner, an emergency nurse, as well as a clinic nurse at the BC Center for Disease Control. Mariko has completed seven missions with MSF, Doctors Without Borders, around the world. Mariko has her Bachelor of Science from UBC, has her Master's in Public Health from the University of London, and is presently attending Athabasca. Right. Oh, yeah. You have all this information. <laughs> uh, true. Okay, thank you. Um, um, yeah, thanks for having us. I think this is a fantastic opportunity to just kind of engage in, in such an important topic. Um, I've worked with MSF in many different countries and in different um, contexts, and my last few missions has been in um, areas of armed conflict. And I would say probably that there are so many complexities on the ground in these kinds of places, but you know, what strikes me the most is just how hard basic survival is and how um, getting access to food and clean water and access to medical care is so compromised due to conflict. Um, you know, when I first worked in the South Sudanese refugee camp, I met so many mothers who would come to me and they, you know, had to make impossible decisions every day about what to prioritize. And they would come into the clinic with a sick baby and in my head I was always wondering, you know, what know, what took you so long to bring this child in? And the answers to that question would often surface, um, and I would really learn to understand how competitive basic survival can be and how many uh, 
needs there are. Many days it was because they were standing all day in line to register for food distribution or they were waiting for food distribution so that they could feed their families. Some days they were out um, getting water because it was too dangerous for them to send their daughters because of the high risk of rape and sexual violence in these areas. Some days they had nobody to take care of the rest of their children and so they just couldn't come in. There were days in our clinic where we would have a six-year-old bring in their one-year-old sibling. That was very common. Um, and some days children would self-present because their parents were too busy or their father was fighting and their mother was, was busy. And so you, you really, you know, living there, you really get an idea of just how busy people can be surviving. You know, um, international organizations like um, MSF, ICRC, uh, IRC, were all, um, We've been increasingly vulnerable in humanitarian spaces, and this has been extraordinarily challenging um, and devastating for us. There has been so many attacks on um, hospitals, on health structures, and on our staff um, that has been so detrimental to the operations in, in the field. Um, we've had to close projects at times, and um, yeah, the losses have been have been really devastating, and sometimes we've had to switch our operational models so that we can continue to provide care. Um, you know, probably just over a year ago, I was working in South Sudan in Unity State, and we were doing mobile clinics because at the time we actually had to close a few clinics because there was just um, more attacks and stuff, and we resorted to doing mobile clinics so that we could continue to access uh, really vulnerable populations. And I will never forget doing a mobile clinic, um, one mobile clinic specifically, uh, because it was such a good example of the kind of challenges people have living in these areas. Um, you know, we were a team of. Oh, I forgot about this. <laughs> okay. Exciting. Um, we there was a team of about three of us, and we flew in. Uh, to a really remote area in um, Unity State, and it was just surrounded by swamplands. And um, you know, the people there were so isolated, and they were so kind of trapped because um, all the roads around these areas were um, in control by the op their opposition, and they didn't really have access to healthcare. And so. Um, you know, the harvest hadn't come in, the crops weren't there, and over the course of just the short time I was just doing a mobile clinic there, I heard over and over from so many people just how hungry they were and that they were living on water and little leaves to survive. And they would actually explain to me how they would, would dry them and grind them and boil them like they were this secret ingredient to survival. Um, you know, the first three, three patients that I saw that day were three young kids who'd all been shot and in the last two to three days, and they were just waiting under shelter, which was really an aluminum container full of bats. It was dark as well. But, um, you know, one boy had been shot three times, and he was shot through his chest, and once through his jaw, and once through his leg. And I, we actually worked with ICRC and, and we were able to medevac them. And I remember sitting and telling them that, you know, how dangerous a traumatic pneumothorax can be and uh, that I thought he was really lucky to still be alive. And I remember later uh, thinking how crazy that conversation was because, you know, luck becomes really hard to make sense of in a place where you've got a 13-year-old boy who's been shot three times and is surviving on water lilies in a conflict zone. Um, you know, for the rest of the two and a half days that I worked there, uh, just this mobile clinic, I, we saw up to 500 people, just me and one other nurse, and we just saw tons of malaria and, and chest infections and diarrhea, and those are really the most common uh, morbidities and mortalities in these areas. And uh, we also saw a lot of malnutrition, which we also see a lot of overlap in areas of conflict because then people are a lot more susceptible to um, infections, communicable diseases, and of course with poor water sanitation, you just, um, you've got a really vulnerable population. Um, so certainly there, there's so many complexities. Um, on another day in just my, my regular clinic, um, you know, parents brought in a seven-year-old girl and 
they carried her in, in a, a small wooden uh, basket, and I remember looking under the blanket that she was in, and um, she had been in a house fire, and the whole bottom half of her body was was really it was really unrecognizable, and um, I was so surprised she hadn't died yet of overwhelming infection. And when I asked when it happened, it happened about a week ago, and they had been walking that whole time through um, swamplands and through areas of, of opposition, and, and they had just had such a long journey just to access medical care. And that is really kind of an example of the realities uh, that, that people face in these kinds of areas. Um, yeah, it's, you know, our work in these areas is so important and it has to continue. Um, you know, when I was leaving Unity State at the end of my contract, I sat in a plane and I remember looking out the window and watching just a stream of women and children walking with all their belongings on their head. And, you know, I, I know they're, they're trying to leave areas of, of conflict and, and insecurity and try to find somewhere safe so that they can be. And sometimes that, um, that journey is is endless, and sometimes that displacement just continues. What else in clinic? Um, so Sudan holds a special place in the heart of I think every expat I know who's ever been there, and um, you know it's a place that is so full of celebration of life and of death and. Um, of this amazing resilience, and um, I, I've, it's always been one of my favorite places in the world. Um, you know, why is our work in areas of armed conflict so important? During my time with MSF, I've seen firsthand the impact that, you know, conflict and war has in such fragile states, and the longitude and the impact it has in, on the health and the economic and the educational systems, as well as the impact on um, you know, mental health and, and sexual violence, you've got rape as a weapon of war, and uh, the, just the loss of human rights. Um, you know, increasingly, humanitarian actors have been targeted in attacks that contravene humanitarian law and have a catastrophic impact on people that are already so vulnerable uh, by war and violence. And I think we, we really need to continue to ensure humanitarian actors have access and we have uh, safe spaces so that we can t continue to provide care and um, you know, work at alleviating suffering and restoring dignity. I really forgot about this. <laughs> uh, but this was actually just in, my last mission was in Iraq, and so this is one of the camps in Iraq. Speechless, and I'm sure I, I speak for all of us that we're humbled by uh, your story. For sure, that. Thank you. Uh, I, I think we're humbled by everybody's story today, and uh, the impact of the work that each of you are contributing and, and doing. I have I have one big question, and 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 and, and hopefully it's the only one I'm going to ask. Uh, what strikes me is, is, is that the work that, that you, the three of you and other people in this room are doing is, uh, is, is just to keep up with today. And, and it sounds like the challenges are pretty overwhelming. And uh, as, I, as I kind of go down this rabbit hole uh, called climate change and I, and I learn more, uh, recently uh, the U.S. Pentagon re released a report that says that within two decades, there will be at least 30 climate-influenced wars with a prediction of between 1 billion and 1.5 billion refugees on the move by mid-century. So another billion to another billion and a half people, half of those are kids, are going to be on the move. Uh, how, how can your organizations, and, and, I mean, I don't, I don't even know what you can think 20 years from now, but, but, but how do your organizations anticipate dealing with that magnitude, assuming even half of it's true. Oh, bring us down. Well, I just, you know, <laughs> it's, well, the work you do is so important. How do you how do you continue it, knowing that it's not gonna it's not gonna get less, it's gonna be more. 
Well, I think a lot of us, uh, you hear this a lot too, of course, lots of us have children or grandchildren and we're thinking about their future. It's not so much. Uh, the window is not about our, our futures, it's about their future. Uh, I think events like this help us to pause for a moment, reflect for a moment on, on what the possibilities are or what some of, some of the ways that we can get involved. Um, and I think, you know, because we're, we're inundated with, with images and ideas and I'm sure I've got my phone and my coat there waiting for me to return some calls and texts and, and Facebook posts. Uh, so we're just like really distracted a lot. So to take the time for, for all of it, take the time to be here this afternoon uh, and, and just uh, hear these stories, uh, the previous speakers and the new speakers, uh, possibly think about how you might be involved. Uh, for me, that's how, how we make a difference, is that we take the time and we provide opportunities for people to hear these stories and, and to put a human face on these stories. Uh, because climate change, and you start talking about billions of people, we can't even grasp that. There's, there's no, no one here that can grasp a, a billion people. Uh, we can grasp 20 people. Maybe we can grasp the 50 that are here. But past that, we can't grasp bigger numbers than that. Um, and so it's really important for us to take the time to work with others, small groups of people, um, uh, understanding the issues, uh, uh, thinking about and, and learning about the, the ways through uh, and what we need our governments to do, what we need our corporations to do, uh, what we need each other to do, and, and, and begin our work that way, one-on-one uh, -on -one with uh, the small groups of people. Thanks, John. Uh, I think one of the speakers earlier said uh, the most important thing we can do is help one child at a time. So that, that brings it back into perspective. Renee, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I guess I think that, <clears throat> you know, getting back to the point I made earlier about uh, the fact that there is a huge amount of interest and uh, potential in terms of harnessing both the power of the crowd and in terms of harnessing the power of the private sector to contribute, I think that we, there's a lot of opportunity there and we don't, we're not doing it well yet. Um, and I think that there's a lot there. Um, and I also think that there's a lot of room for innovation. And I don't just mean technology. <clears throat> I mean just, uh, um, I mean room for trying to do things differently, uh, piloting it out, finding out what you can, and you know, having spaces to learn so that you can iterate on um, what's worked and what hasn't, and then replicate it um, <clears throat> where appropriate. Um, do more beyond that, but at the very least, you need the organizations that are already there working well together. So I think the coordination piece is really important. So we're still hoping. Pardon Lots me? of hope. I, I don't think that we in North America can afford to uh, to be taken <coughs> down by uh, despair. Uh, I, I work with too many people who are in much worse situations, who whose resilience is incredible, and it, it would it is. I don't think I help them by by uh, not being vulnerable. I agree. Uh, Marika, what do you think? Um, well, I think I think what you guys have both said has been really um, yeah, valuable, and I think that we're sort of in a phase where there's so much kind of there's so many competing issues and priorities uh, politically and environmentally and. There, I mean, I, I think there are times where I feel this this sense of humanitarian exhaustion, particularly with the Syrian crisis, which has been going on for so long, and um, you know, the media is really, you know, we've we've heard so many just horrible stories come out over and over and over again, and um, it can become, I, I think it 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 can be become a little bit uh, um, discouraging. Um, the climate climate issues have been around for so long, and you know we, we know the links between sort of disaster, um, you know natural disasters and climate change, and we know we really need to focus on sort of risk mitigation and disaster response and be prepared for that. Particularly um, knowing what potential impact there we may see, especially with migration and movement, and it's something we need to monitor very well. And, um, really kind of work together and I, I think Renee's presentation was fantastic and I was so happy to see um, those links because so much of it is really um, that kind of communication and those networks and that contact on the ground so that we're always up to date with, with really what's going on. But yeah, climate change is a massive issue and I think we just need to continue speaking out, um, you know, as well, as much as we can. I guess I, guess I would just add to that, <clears throat> we need to, do a better job at preventing disasters from happening in the first place because, uh, I mean, climate change is going to be uh, difficult to 
pre it prevent, but it is, but it's, we can at least try to do what we can to make it, uh, the effects uh, less bad than they can be. Um, <clears throat> and at the very least, um, if we know what's going to be happening, we can take steps in advance of, them be of it becoming an acute disaster. I think that there's a prevention on that side. And then in terms of conflicts, conflicts that are non-disaster related, there are, there are, there can be more effort. I mean, if you, we look at the military budget that is put in and compare that to, to the amount that is put into peace, peace work, uh, it's crazy. Uh, and that, that ratio is going to go up even higher with um, the U.S.'s uh, reallocation um, of their budget. So, I mean, that, that's a very big concern for me. <clears throat> We could we could get into the Donald Trump discussion, but but I, I'll, I'll I'll give him a minute. Um, I, I do want to ask you know, on the on the theme of that though, it, it it speaks to activism and it can take on many forms. And I'm wondering what the three of you have to would recommend in terms of what more we can do in this room. I'll, sure, I'll start again. Uh, I've increasingly come to understand that activism is about. Uh, talking to one person at a time. Uh, I think that takes back to the first answer as well. Uh, and, and, and in the process, uh, enabling and empowering them to do the same with the next person they meet. Um, and we've, we've seen that technique used a lot in political campaigning in the last few years. Uh, and a lot of other social movements have started to use this approach where they understand it's no longer uh, adequate or even uh, makes any sense for, for a person to have a relationship, say, with the head office. It's more about who else in your community can you connect with to work on these projects. So whether it's, whether it's the environment, whether it's environmental issues, whether it's human rights issues, whether it's local issues or global issues, uh, nothing happens without us talking to one another about it and getting and helping those, those people that we're in, in contact with uh, to be able to talk to others. When I do training now with volunteers, one of the things we do is I talk to them about an elevator pitch. And probably you've heard that phrase used where you need to be able to explain something in the time it takes you to get from the first floor to like the fifth floor, the sixth floor or whatever. Uh, and most people would say, well, you know, what are you working on these days, you know, in terms of your, your, your leisure time, I guess. Um, you say, well, I, I help out with Amnesty International. Oh, what's that? And if you don't have an answer ready, you're probably going to blow your chance to, to talk to someone about, uh, about the organization that you care very deeply about. Uh, and so we practice a 30-second you know, elevator pitch of what is Amnesty International. So you have it in your words. It's not about our mandate, our mission, our mandate statement. It's about what does it mean for you? What was it that brought you to Amnesty or, or Peace Geeks or Dogs Without Borders? Uh, what, was the, what was the story that connected you to that organization? And then having that in your elevator pitch. So it's actually from you, not from an institution. Um, and uh, you know, so that, that starts to enable our volunteers to, to talk to others about the work that we're doing. And, and spreading the word that way. And, and we see this, as I said, in political campaigns and, and other movements are using it as well. And so we're increasingly using that approach as well. And I think it, I find it's really effective. Renee, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with Don. And I, I guess I would add that on the community level, I mean, we have found, uh, you know, one, we do, um, one of the things that we do is hackathons. And uh, we do those with two goals in mind. One is sometimes to come up with tech but sometimes it's really just around trying to help people see the possibilities um, and try to build relationships um, across interdisciplinary groups that don't traditionally work together. Um, and um, you know, we, we actually we were involved in, a, in an event called Diplo Hack, which is a terrible name. But anyway, um, it was a, basically the uh, they came to the Netherlands that was held, holding this event um, with, with a, a group in Ottawa. And it was basically around trying to explore how technology can be used in different ways within conflict uh, situations. And so barrel bombs was one of the issues and uh, spreading misinformation and so on. And it was including tech people um, and nonprofits, but it also actually brought in, in that case, uh, folks from uh, policymakers from, from, the, from global affairs. And that was really great because I think it was, it was a group of people who hadn't really been exposed to that kind of a, a context before and it really started to catalyze conversations within, within, within folks in global affairs around how, um, what other ways this type of an event could, um, could use to catalyze a conversation and, and change. And so I think it's, you know, first of all, you need to start to help people see the potential and then uh, try to create uh, places where those can flourish. Mariko, any thoughts about uh, collaborations or uh, activism? Well, I mean, I mean, I, I think you guys covered a lot of things. I think, um, you know, I think activism is so huge, and it's been a big part of my life for 
um, over the last 15 years at least. And um, I think it's it, it does come down to sort of personal stories and people really getting a better understanding of what it's like to live in someone else's shoes. And sometimes um, that can be really hard when we're, we're just, we're also all kind of surviving in our day-to-day -day busyness and stuff. Um, I know MSF did like a, we do a mock refugee camp each year where people can get a better idea of, of what it's it's really like and um, of course, you know, personal stories. I, I think one of the, the limitations to me just from my experience is that a lot of the most invisible people, the people that, that don't really have a voice are the ones that we, we really don't hear enough uh, from in terms of the stories and, um, you know, they are just the most vulnerable and they don't have access to the social media platforms that we use all the time. and. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think with the, all the sort of technology movements and social media now, I think there are so many avenues to communicate and to advocate, and I think it's fantastic, and it's really changed uh, so much about activism, but uh, I, I think we just need to continue working away at it. Now, does anybody in the room have any questions? You're so quiet, <laughs> so well-behaved. I, I have a question. I, I, I was going to come to you, because... <laughs> Or go ahead, fire. Okay. okay. Um, so actually, um, and this very much comes back to this, the point that I've been making around um, partnership with the private sector. Um, you know, hum I think our, some of our previous panelists talked about how important it is to be humanitarians um, and to be seen as independent. Um, but if we're bringing in people like us who aren't strictly humanitarian, or bringing in private sector organizations or volunteers who don't identify. Do you have any thoughts on how that potentially impacts your work and your your um, your your clients? So, come on. <laughs> yes. Just conceptually, if one of mine. Uh, it's okay. Um, local stories, local action. That stuck out to me at, on the slide. And it seems that cities, by de facto, have a municipal foreign policy that's distinct from the state, the, the, the federal government. For example, the Canadian government may be working out of necessity with a dictatorship. Working with that dictatorship produces refugees which end up in our cities. Mayors, councillors, aldermen wish to get elected, they will cater to the refugees, which is at odds in foreign policy with the federal government. So the local stories, uh, and maybe just to the last point was loud sourcing versus crowd sourcing. So it's the job to get more stories out, which was one and one and one. I don't know if I have a question, it's just came to my mind. No, it's a good point. And you know, it's, it's a great conversation to, to start to keep it going. Uh, I, I, had, I, was, I was curious about some of the earlier speakers about, there was lots of talk about gender, not a lot of talk about LGBTQ, and I was curious about that. Uh, any, um, any volunteers? Okay. Sure, uh, I, think, I think that the, the thing you consider when we talk about gender, it's not necessarily just women, that's why we mentioned gender, not women. Um, because gender is about a role. It's not about a, a biological. Um, and, and I guess the point there is that um, you know, we want to we wanna make sure that these barriers that, that are gender related, which could be because of your biological relation or because of your identity, um, are eliminated. So maybe we don't mention it outright because um, it, it's not at the, um, because it's not that the most common occurring things, but, but we definitely in our work are trying to get rid of those barriers that prevent any kind of discrimination based on, on, on you know, the biological part or the identity part of gender. Maybe the question is different here, uh, but, but you know, we we seldom in media get the opportunity to talk to you or the people in the field that are actually doing the work. So, and, and the conversation in Canada or Vancouver in Canada is certainly different than the one in the U.S. But when you go further around the world, the conversation about LGBTQ 
becomes quite precarious in some countries. So I'm just curious how you how you see or how you deal with that. That's a, that's a very good point. I mean, we also like in, in different contexts we approach it differently. Um, you know, in some places where, where it might be illegal, um, just coming out and saying no, that's wrong, will probably um, marginalize us from providing any help at all. Right? Um, it's not to say that we, we we shouldn't be outspoken on these things, but we also have to you know, find the correct spaces to do it. Um, you know, in, in, in contexts where it is like here. In, we have seen that children do work here in Canada as well. And here it is at the forefront of our, of our discussion when we're talking about helping indigenous communities uh, prepare for emergencies. We look at all these different aspects. And, and, um, but in some contexts, it's, it's sometimes, I guess, uh, like as I was saying before, you need to start off small. And as you're gaining the trust of, of, of the public, but also of the local governments, perhaps, then you can start bringing up some of the Northeast delicate subjects. Um, and if you, and if, unfortunately, the humanitarian side, we usually don't. But we also do a lot of development work, and that's where these, these points do come through. Yeah, I really appreciate your answer. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm just really curious and, and, and hopefully asking a really open and honest no, that's, that's why I'm question. <laughs> okay. no, I'm grateful. Does anybody else have any questions, any thoughts, anything you want to contribute or add? Now is the time. Uh, yes. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could speak to like how you um, address the danger of the volunteers, maybe to your volunteers, um, especially the the first speaker talked Pray, about. Pray, I'm Yeah, we're probably a bit different from the other organizations here. We don't actually send volunteers into conflict zones or into camps or even to do research missions. Um, you know, our, our research is all done by professionals, by staff, or people that are contracted to do that work. And absolutely, there's risk assessments done around how safe it is for them to be there. Although increasingly, we are at the center of, uh, inside, you know, sort of behind the lines where the bombs are dropping uh, in the refugee camps. Uh, in the middle of the protest, you know, monitoring and watching and, and recording and documenting what's going on around us. Uh, but it's not somewhere we would send volunteers. Uh, so we wouldn't have that kind of opportunity. I don't know if my colleagues here can speak to that. Yeah, I mean, MSF, I mean, we do a lot of uh, risk analysis uh, at any time we're starting a project. And so we do a lot of SWOT analysis and looking at the potential um, risks of any interventions we're doing. Uh, we have a very low threshold for evacuation in areas of conflict. And a lot of these countries, I mean, we've, we've already been working there for many years, like Yemen, Syria, like we, we know these countries fairly well. And, um, you know, we generally have fairly uh, strict security rules and protocols, and, and those are very clear and in place uh, once you're, you're working in the field. Um, you know, I, I think one of the biggest uh, probably challenges in some places, like I mean, um, you know, Afghanistan and um, Syria, is that we've had to shift into operational models that are a little bit more remote uh, management and remote operations because of the insecurity and because of the challenges of um, being seen as a target. And, and that's really been, I mean, we've been able to work with that. And, and uh, do amazing things in terms of uh, supporting, uh, doing MSF supportive uh, roles. Um, but certainly, you know, anywhere where we are working and we have a project, we, we do certainly have very clear security rules that we have to follow or we get in a lot of trouble. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'll just add that we, um, we don't send volunteers uh, overseas at all. Um, most of the work that we do um, is from where people are, from their homes. Uh, there is some, that, that's probably going to change a little bit in the coming year, but um, but we have, again, pretty strict assessments for for um, making sure that we're not, um, that we're 
to making responsible decisions around who's going and where they're going. It does beg the question, do you have more people joining you online in different parts of the world? Yep, we have a, we have a global network of volunteers. Okay. So you're so so at some point that level of concern may grow. Uh, I mean, some of our volunteers live in. I mean, one of our one of our partners in Burundi um, last year or two years ago, um, they had been running a campaign against the president to uh, to ask him not to run for a third term, um, and his um, his his team and the core uh, principles for the other 10 organizations that were involved in that campaign all became targets. Uh, and uh, quite a few of their members were volunteers of ours and they all had to flee the country. Uh, they're now refugees in Rwanda, United States and Canada. And, uh, and so, I mean, that's not, they weren't, they weren't sort of doing work on behalf of the peace keeps, but we certainly uh, feel some responsibility to try to do what we can to support them in those cases. And, their evacuations. And there's actually some other, we, we, that was a sort of a one time thing, but there were quite a few. There's, there's organizations dedicated to that type of work, to helping to evacuate people who are at risk. It's a, it's a real concern. I hope I hope we've answered your questions. Uh, I don't know whether you heard Christine earlier, uh, but some of the stories of the Red Cross workers is quite, quite horrific and uh, sad, but uh, we're grateful the work that you and your team do. Um, Mariko, Don, Renee, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure. And thanks for sharing. Thanks, Don. Well, it is my pleasure to thank, again, this panel led by Don. Um, some really great questions. Thank you. I feel like all three panel members um, Again, Don. I'm loving this Don Don. Renee and Mariko, thank you very much. I really feel richer for having listened to your stories and your contributions. Um, and I hope everyone's enjoyed today. Can we have a round of applause for everybody? In the room? I forgot to mention before the last break, but we have a survey. <laughs> um, and if you fill it out, it really helps us have other events like this. So please grab your smartphones. It would take you two minutes maximum to do that, and we'd appreciate it. Um, we have another event coming up as well on Monday, March 20th.